welcome and thank you for joining us to the Future Homes Ottawa Retrofits webinar. Uh, my name is Melanie Johnston and I will be presenting along with Chris Habits this evening. <clears throat> so for those of you who don't know us, Enviro Centre is a nonprofit environmental organization based here in Ottawa. Our core mission supports sustainable lifestyles, which means that we encourage people to take action on climate in their own lives, in their homes, their workplaces and businesses, their communities and right here in our city. Our work focuses on four key areas, uh, green homes, green transportation, green business and green lifestyle. Today we're here to talk about the green homes in Ottawa through our Future Homes pilot project. Future Homes Ottawa is a neighbourhood retrofit project currently running in two pilot neighbourhoods, Carlington and Old Ottawa South. By sharing practical information and helpful resources for homeowners looking to take action to improve the energy efficiency of their homes, Future Homes Ottawa provides dedicated support for folks interested in planning a home retrofit project or simply learning more. So before we get started, we just have a few logistical notes. Um, please note that this session is being recorded and shared online after the event. If we can ask you to keep yourself muted during the presentation so that everyone is able to hear the speakers and we'll be monitoring questions in the chat box. So please type them there and we'll bring them forward for a Q&A period following the presentation uh, or live questions as time allows. So once again, welcome to everybody in our audience and a big special welcome to Chris um, from Good Habits. So I'm gonna to start to share my screen uh, and we'll go through our official presentation. I'm gonna look at Chris for the heads up. Can we see that? Awesome, let me just get it started from the beginning. Always miss that part. Right, so here we are, the Retrofits webinar. So again, Enviro Center, our mission uh, is to provide people, communities, and organizations with pra practical solutions to lighten their environmental impact in lasting ways. And our vision is dramatic reductions in greenhouse gas emissions that are achieved through inspired environmental action and positive change. Who is Mel? Uh, I'm Mel. I am the uh, Director of Energy Programs with Enviro Center. I have been with Enviro Center since 2009, and apparently I'm instrumental in the development and delivery of our home retrofit programs. Um, so basically, we manage a whole bunch of different uh, programs that have to do with home energy. And um, my role is to direct the whole group and help with the development and implementation of training of energy advisors, as well as our contractors in best practices and understanding the house as a system. Joining me today is Chris Habits, my new partner in crime. So Chris is a professional engineer with a degree in sustainable and renewable energy engineering from Carleton University. He is a certified energy auditor, Enercan Home Energy Advisor, has all kinds of lead credentials, uh, and he runs an HVAC engineering firm as well. Now, my favorite part about Chris is that unofficially, he is a certified energy nerd, enjoying spending his spare time optimizing his, his family's, and his friend's home for energy efficiency. This is someone after my own heart. <laughs> Chris also thinks insulation is sexy. So, <laughs> So what is the Future Homes Ottawa project? It is a pilot project and it is Ottawa's first neighborhood retrofit project currently running in Carlington and Old Ottawa South. So this project will support the creation of neighborhood demonstration projects where residents can learn from their neighbors about planning a deep retrofit project, where to start, how to succeed and what you gain. So today we're gonna cover a few things, why we need to retrofit, the different types of retrofits, steps to get there, and how Future Homes Ottawa can help. <clears throat> so why? In April of 2019, the City of Ottawa declared a climate emergency. At that time, they developed a group called Energy Evolution, and they set aggressive greenhouse gas emissions targets um, for reduction. They're going to do that through existing homes, uh, new homes, transportation, and waste. So in Ottawa, existing homes make up 45% of Ottawa's greenhouse gas emissions. They come from our existing housing. And we need to retrofit 27% of those dwellings by 2030 and 98% of those dwellings to be retrofitted by 2050. And in fact, my numbers might be slightly out of date because the city has actually moved to even more aggressive um, retrofits. But the long and the short of it is we have well over 350,000 residents in the city of Ottawa that will need to be retrofitted to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions for us to be able to meet our climate reduction targets. <clears throat> so what are the types of retrofits? What do we mean by retrofits? 
A retrofit is basically any home renovation that reduces energy consumption and fossil fuel use. So we've, we've kind of classified them into basic retrofits, deep retrofits, net zero ready and net zero. And we can talk about what those mean. <clears throat> so I'm big on conservation first. Um, we all know that we have to get off fossil fuels and that we're gonna have to move to electricity, but we don't wanna overload our grids to start off with. So really we need to look at reducing the amount of consumption we have in our homes. And we can do that by a lighting retrofit. So replacing your existing lighting with LED lights, and that can have a reduction in your lighting consumption of about 75% looking at appliances um, and replacing those with Energy Star. Um, I always like to plug an induction stove. So for those folks who like to cook with gas, we do need to move off of natural gas, but an induction stove will give you that same enjoyment of cooking. Um, and we can see reductions in energy of up to 10 to 15%. And then smart systems um, are actually pretty key. Those systems will start to learn your behaviors, they adapt to your behaviors, and they will um, manage your energy for you. Um, it also gives you a visual display of your energy use, which I think can be very helpful um, for folks to actually see when they're using energy and how they're using energy so that they can change behaviors. And those systems can um, actually have an energy reduction of about 30 to 40 percent in your overall energy use. So then we start to get into what we call summer basic and summer deep. We're kind of on the fence here. So it depends on how far you really want to go. But basically what we need to do is look at the building envelope as a whole. And we want to tighten that up. So we want to add insulation to your attics, to your basements, to your um, exterior walls. And we do want to do some comprehensive air sealing. That's going to make the home more comfortable for sure, less drafty, uh, cooler in the summer, warmer in the winter, but it also will ensure that when you do start to look at replacing your mechanical systems, they are right sized for the home. So if you've got an older, leakier home, you may be looking at a, a bigger furnace or a bigger heating source than as opposed to if your house is nice and tight and, and not letting any air in or out. Um, and again, we're looking at, you know, depending on how far you go with your insulation work, anywhere from 10 to 25 percent in energy savings by measure per year. Same thing with mechanicals. Um, certainly, you know, if you're looking at doing sort of what we would consider a basic um, uh, retrofit, you'd be looking at maybe moving to a high efficiency gas furnace. Um, but really, if you're starting to look at more deeper retrofits, you're going to be looking at heat pump systems and um, systems that aren't going to be reliant on natural gas. Um, so we do look for fuel switching at this point. Um, when, we, when we get into our energy audit and we start to make recommendations, certainly we're going to be recommending that folks are moving off of their natural gas furnaces and into a more sustainable um, energy source. We also look at ventilation. So because we touched our envelope first and we made the house nice and airtight, we now have to look at actually providing adequate ventilation in the house to make sure that we're getting <clears throat> fresh air in the home. So we're not causing any air quality issues. So those are some of the recommendations as well that we would be looking at. Um, and again, those would be based on electricity as opposed to working off of any fossil fuels. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, we are definitely um, having a lot of focus on air and ground sourced heat pumps. So we will be having other sessions um, through the course of the pilot project where we'll be providing more information on heat pump systems. So ultimately what we want to do is we want to get homes to net zero. So basically a net zero home produces as much clean energy as they consume um, so that they're basically offsetting any energy that you are using with some um, prepared energy or renewable energy. So typically these homes are 80% more energy efficient than a typical new home and they use, use renewable energy systems to produce the remaining energy they need. Basically every part of the house works together to provide consistent temperatures throughout, prevent drafts and fil uh, filter indoor air to reduce dust and allergens. So the difference between a net zero and a net zero ready home is that a net zero home would have the renewable backups, whereas a net zero ready home is basically everything you can do to get yourself to net zero. And then we add on the renewable components. So you can still do a ton of work and see a dramatic reduction in your energy use by getting just to the net zero stage. So how do we get started with all of this? Um, we start with an energy audit. Uh, so basically that is a visit uh, with a registered energy advisor that comes into your home. They spend 
anywhere from two to three hours, depending on your home and how engaged you are going through the different elements, um, looking at your insulation levels, looking at your mechanicals, again, really having a conversation with the homeowner um, on what your areas of concern are. Is it, is it a comfort thing? Are you uncomfortable in certain rooms of your home? Are you interested in reducing your carbon footprint and therefore you wanna look at some you know, different technologies um, or you're just curious in general as to what's going on in the home. After that visit, you'd be given an upgrade report. And again, that is based on your concerns um, as well as sort of best practices and, and ways that we would expect that you would um, undertake some of the work. You're given an enter guide label. This is a visual uh, comparison of sort of how your house compares to every other house in Canada, actually. And then as part of the Future Homes pilot project, we will also be providing stepped recommendations to net zero. So this is an add-on report that we would provide to you to show you exactly all of the different steps that you would need to take to get your home to net zero. <clears throat> so getting involved, becoming a demonstration home. Essentially, as part of the Future Homes Project, we have a few outcomes. We're looking at testing marketing and outreach and engagement um, opportunities and, and what resonates in these communities and how folks digest information and want to get involved. But ultimately, what we're trying to do is um, find three to six demonstration homes. So we sent out a survey. We had well over 600 respondents. And 55% of the respondents said that a lack of knowledge around the most effective retrofits was preventing them from retrofitting their home. So that's why we're going to have information sessions like these. Um, 300 or more respondents to our resident engagement survey also expressed interest in participating in a demonstration home, which was really exciting for us. So for the three to six demonstration project homes, um, what we would be offering as part of the future homes project is some additional project planning and coordination, a review of our, your local contractors and going through your quotes with you, um, providing some recommendations there, and then helping you support or supporting you, sorry, in navigating the financial incentives and the rebate programs that are available. <clears throat> so what does make a good home for a demonstration project home? Basically, we want you to be willing to implement the measures that move you to net zero. So, you know, being committed to actually making some changes in your home and importantly, really is sharing your journey. So we do want to be able to share as much as we can with folks in your neighborhood so that they can learn from you. So whether it be through photos, videos, blogs, um, we just love to be able to gather as much information as we can. Also looking to have folks share their utility data. So this is a, another way for us to be able to quantify the results in the home. So by looking at your um, pre-retrofit utility data and then looking at your post-retrofit utility data, we're actually going to be able to start to see the changes in the home and, and what that means from an energy consumption and also from your utility bills and how much you're paying. And then lastly, we're always after surveys. Um, certainly, you know, lots of folks are looking for data. And so we are trying to survey as many folks at different points throughout the project so that we can um, really be able to replicate this project and roll it out across the city when it's not in a pilot stage any longer. So, of course, the biggest question here is how are you going to pay for all of this work? Um, I am not independently wealthy. I don't think I could just turn around and retrofit my house to net zero without some incentives. So there's quite a few options right now for you. Um, the utility rebates and incentives. So Enbridge Gas has incentives currently for um, increasing insulation levels, uh, replacing windows and doors, and really having a good look at the envelope side of things. And then uh, this year, we also had the launch of the Natural Resources Greener Homes Program. That's $5,000 worth of grants. Um, and those things would also apply to building envelope upgrades, but they're also looking at me mechanicals and they've included renewables as part of that. So once you're ready to start making that, that jump into different things, you can access $5,000 in grants from Natural Resources Canada. And then lastly, there's the um, City of Ottawa's Better Homes Loan Program. So that loan program should be launching next week. And it's a zero interest loan of up to $125,000 or 10% of your property value. And that would go towards, again, anything energy efficient. So if it's, you know, again, replacing your mechanicals, looking at renewables, um, there's an, an option for adding additional uh, a nanny suite or an additional dwelling to your home, which um, would offset as well some costs of doing some of your retrofits and give some additional income. 
Uh, and it, the other thing it covers is some health and safety type of things. So things that we don't often think about, but for instance, if you're going to retrofit your home and you're going to drill a whole bunch of holes in your walls to add insulation, you can use a portion of the loan funds to repaint the home uh, so that you don't see all the holes in your walls. Um, so really more information to come on that. We'll, there'll be several sessions um, being hosted by Enviro Center and other groups around uh, the specifics of the loan program once it's officially launched. So for resources, where can you find out more information? Certainly you can email futurehomes at envirocenter.ca. We have somebody there who will monitor um, emails and respond to inquiries. Your energy report and conversations with your energy advisor, a great place to start um, with what you should be doing. Uh, Natural Resources Canada's website has quite a bit of information, um, contractors and people in your community. And then I'll plug our Better Homes Ottawa website, which is also launching uh, early next week, hopefully on Monday. Um, and that should be a one-stop shop for all homeowners. And it will have information on how to get an energy audit, the benefits of an energy audit, as well as access to incentives and rebates, planning your retrofit. Uh, there will be some information on a directory or for some guidelines for how to hire a contractor. So that is what we hope to be um, somewhere that a lot of folks are going to be able to go and get tons of information about retrofitting and, and how to get your house to be more energy efficient. And that takes me to the end of my presentation. So we will definitely open it up to questions. Um, Chris is here to join me. He is an energy advisor, as mentioned, has a ton of technical experience. So you get as technical as you want. And if you'd like to answer any questions about administration, that's what I'm here for. So we did have a couple in the chat that I may as well start us off with. Um, one person wanted to know what renewables were and by renewables, we mean renewable energy generation. So solar power, theoretically wind power, I think 99% of the time it's solar panel power when it comes to renovations. And uh, Linda asked if there are any provincial grants and the short answer is not really in Ontario right now. Some exceptions for some things, but probably nothing that's going to apply to single family residential at the moment. And then Doug just asked if there's any plans for multi-unit buildings. Um, now let's kind of a little more on the admin side there. Yeah, sure. Doug, thank you for your question. I may or may not recognize that name. Um, so through the funding right now, through Greener Homes, unfortunately, multi-unit buildings are not included in that. Um, through the Better Homes loan, we are looking at small multi-unit buildings, certainly um, you know, anything that is basically a part nine, so no bigger than three stories, no larger than 600 square meters. Yes. Um, However, on the Better Homes Ottawa website, we do plan on having information on uh, multi-residential units, so condos, high-rises, and, and what folks can do. That will have a little bit more focus right now on some on energy efficiency for sure, um, but also um, things around EVs, waste, and other ways that we can reduce our impact. But at this time, uh, not a lot of funding, unfortunately, for multi-res. Although I will say the... Ottawa Home Loans Program that does attack or touch on the multi-res is, mm. as a landlord myself, I am planning to take advantage of it uh, in my duplex. Um, so, yes. Um, another question here is when will Enviro Center be selecting its demonstration homes? No. That's a really good question. So right now we're in audit stage. So Chris is one of our energy advisors. We're doing 20 energy audits in Old Ottawa South and 20 energy audits in Carlington. At that point, um, you'll receive your reports, you'll receive your stepped recommendations, and then we'll be asking folks actually to apply to become uh, a demonstration home. Then it would based on, be based on a bunch of different criteria. So really, you know, what are you looking to do in the home? Um, you know, what the timeline is for those improvements, but certainly, um, you know, stay tuned if you want to sign up. I think we've got a, a, a newsletter that goes out at least. Um, Darren can always put a link in the chat, um, but we will be doing so very close to the end of the year. We essentially want to get all of our audits done by the end of November, mm -hmm. at which point we'll start to look at the reports. And we, at that point, will also be looking at the, the possible recommendations and reaching out to folks and saying, look, your house looks like a good demonstration home potential. Are you interested? And here's the application form. But I mean, we'd rather have more interest than not enough. That's definitely for sure. 
So I would suggest, yeah, by the end of the year, very early next year, and then starting to actually work on the plans to get those retrofitted um, next year. Sorry, I had to mute myself for a second there. My son sounded like he was pushing his little table around. He's three, ah, so yes. <laughs> kind of hard to convince him to be quiet. Um, the Somebody's asked, what are the typical upgrades that can or should be done on a 20-year-old home? The short answer is it depends, and I apologize for that. Um, the longer answer is typically the, the heat pump. If you haven't replaced the furnace or AC yet, a heat pump is something that is pretty much a slam dunk at this point. Um, windows are a possibility and it depends how far you want to go. Are you going for net zero or are you going for reasonably efficient? Um, so the first step would be to get an energy audit done and then we'd be able to tell you. <laughs> yeah, I would say too as well, this, the heating system is definitely, you know, if you haven't done anything with your home, um, then by now you're probably looking at replacing your heating system. And I would suggest that building code, um, insulation levels and building code has, has increased. So um, definitely some attic insulation and some air sealing, but it really does depend on, on how your house was built and who built it. And, uh, you know, if you've done any major renovations as well. Yeah, exactly. Um, we have a question about what heat uh, heat pumps are and what they're for. So a heat pump, and that's a very good question. A uh, heat pump is, it's basically an air conditioner that runs both ways. So it can either cool your house or it can heat your house. Uh, they are very energy efficient. They use far less energy per kilowatt hour of heat into the house. Uh, they're really just magic. They're 300% efficient roughly to heat and cool your home. Um, so magic is the simple answer. The, the long answer is I really like them. They're very greenhouse gas friendly and it's just an alternative method of heating basically. The added benefit as well is if your home does not have central air, they will cool your home as well. So when we're looking at some older housing stock and, you know, if I'm thinking about Carlington and I'm thinking about maybe some vet style homes, which I happen to live in, uh, one of, uh, I don't have central air in my home. So by installing a heat pump system, I would also get the benefit of, of cooling the home in the, in the summertime. Well, that's a good one for you there, Chris. You want to give us the difference between a net zero house and a passive house? <laughs> yes, I can do that. Uh, so they are different standards. A passive house is a very specific standard that is trying to basically heat and cool the home without actually using any energy in effect. Um, so you're designing the windows such that the sun comes in in the winter but doesn't come in the summertime. And you're dealing with... Uh, it's a, it's a complex standard. It, it's the higher level. Net zero means your home is generating as much electricity or energy as it's using, um, which is a much simpler way of looking at it. So most passive houses probably are net zero or better if they have any generation, but there are more net zero houses out there. Okay, well, we've got quite a few questions about heat pumps, but let's go to Melanie's question in regards to what a renter can do. Uh, so the Greener Homes program, sorry, I should say the Enbridge Gas program, you could uh, have your landlord apply for that particular program. The Greener Homes program, unfortunately, only covers your primary residence. So as Chris was saying earlier, he's got a duplex. He would not be able to apply for the Greener Homes program for that duplex. He has to live in the home. I guess he could apply for his portion of the duplex. Uh, however, the Better Homes Loan Program would be a great place there. So you uh, could have your landlord apply for that program, make the investments. They've got a zero interest loan that is tied to the property. Um, so it wouldn't, shouldn't impact your, um, your rent uh, and they could implement those energy efficient upgrades. So certainly um, we will be making presentations about the loan program to landlord associations and groups like that. And we'd be happy to share that information. I should also mention that the utilities also run programs for folks that are mid to low income that are actually free and provide you with free insulation um, upgrades to your home if you meet income criteria and your home is, you know, can benefit from insulation upgrades. So there's a free option there as well. Um, basically, we just need your landlord's permission to come in and do an energy audit. And then and we've got a question I, about commercial buildings. Chris, here. 
Yeah, yeah I ahead. can do, I can answer that one, but I, I want to touch on the renting thing again. And this applies for everybody. Um, make sure your light bulbs are LEDs. Don't set your heat to 24 and your AC to 17. Set back when you leave the house. This kind of stuff, uh, if you have that control, it's way more um, effective than, than you might think, um, especially the light bulbs. Uh, it's the first thing I did when I moved into my house was replace every light bulb with LEDs. $150, whatever it is, and it saves me $150 every year. So anyway, um, moving on to the commercial buildings question. That has a lot of different options, um, depending on what kind of building it is and what it's used for. Most of them are through either Enbridge or the IESO, so the Integrated Energy of Ontario. I can't recall what, uh, what the... Uh, acronym is for, but basically the IESO and Enbridge both have some relatively large grants and rebates available for very specific things. Uh, so Eva, please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, I've got a lot of information about those. Sure. All right. So Vivian is asking, what if I'm interested in being a demo home, but don't meet the criteria for one reason or another? How can I access advice on that case? Well, Vivian, we would love to have some demonstration homes and we want to demonstrate as much as we can. So I think we would just have a very frank conversation about what the criteria is and what you want to do and how we can get you involved because we would love to have lots of folks engaged. So I would suggest getting the energy audit for sure. And then we can, uh, we can follow up with you if you're really interested in becoming a demo home and seeing what we can, how we can provide some support to you in that. <clears throat> okay, Anne's got some windows that she's looking to replace. They're definitely eligible for rebates, uh, $125 or $250, depending per window, depending on which grade of window you go to replace. Um, touching on windows from a technical perspective, they're not, if your windows are reasonably good, so something installed in the last 30 years, they are not always the first thing I'm looking at. And, uh, People are always surprised by that. Windows is the first thing you think of, but they end up being kind of a, a maybe in a lot of cases, um, unless you're trying to get down to net zero or your house is otherwise quite good, or you've got cracked, broken, or very old windows. Um, however, the rebates exist and they, they work. So there we go. Uh, somebody's asked what kind of wait times are you looking for at the initial home audit for the Greener Homes program? So for greener homes, if you're just looking at that on your own, we are actually booking out to February right now. However, we have been onboarding registered energy advisors and hope to have more slots um, sooner rather than later. In fact, I believe our schedule starts to open up again in November. If you're interested in participating in the Future Homes pilot project where you live in Carlington, we actually have um, set aside some slots. So we have availability probably as early as next week uh, for some slots for future homes. So if you live in Carlington, within the boundaries of Carlington, um, whether you're wanting to proceed with being a demo home or not, we can still prioritize an energy audit for you. You do, of course, have to register with uh, the Greener Homes program. Uh, you would receive what's called an AP number. And we are actually just going back with natural, back and forth with Natural Resources Canada now to, um, clarify some of the, the rules around proceeding prior to you getting an actual approval from Enercan because those are taking actually a couple of months to come through. They had a significant amount of backlog, but um, yeah, the long and the short of it is we can get you started at future homes within the next two, three weeks. And if you're not in, living in those neighborhoods or not interested in participating in the pilot project at all, then um, we're looking at booking it into February. And so I think that maybe answers Jane's question again, which is also, is it too late to arrange an audit? No, never too late to arrange an audit. We've got spots available under future homes. Um, and again, if you're just looking at, you know, getting involved and getting that information, um, just, uh, you know, head to Enviro Center and we can, we can definitely get you in the books at, at some point here, depending on your availability. Oh, that, this is such actually, a good uh, question, Chris. I love yeah. a cold climate heat pump question. <laughs> I actually don't have my Friday one. I don't have the details yet, so it might be filled in, but I've got one on Friday morning still. Oh, uh, look I'm at sure that, Chris. Will get filled. I haven't <laughs> had one not get filled in yet. It will get filled in. Uh, yeah. but, but I do have a Friday morning off still, so nice. 
Um, so heat pump actually deal with our very cold winters. Yes, um, they do work below minus 10. So there are, there are options out there that will go down to minus 25, um, minus 26 is kind of your, your peak. You will need a backup heat. I design HVAC systems and when I'm putting these in, it's typically an electric resistive backup on top of the uh, heat pump air handler. And that probably runs 50 to 100 hours a year. So it's actually a lot less often than, than people think. Uh, I had a house today. He had just installed a gas furnace last year. So he's going to put, well, this is his current plan, put a not cold climate heat pump on top of it and just use the gas as the backup heat. So that's an option as well. Significantly less expensive up front than the cold climate ones and still a lot of greenhouse gas savings. Um, but the short answer is yes, we can get down to minus 25 with modern heat pumps now and, and be operating quite efficiently. That's a good uh, segue. Yeah. Good segue into the next question. What is the average cost to purchase and install a heat pump in a 2,000 square foot home? Again, it kind of depends. Uh, brand name and installer and installer availability are all affecting this a lot. So a year ago, I probably would have told you somewhere in the $15,000 range, give or take five to $10,000, depending on what you really want to do. Um, today, it's gone up a little bit from that, but I, I couldn't possibly give you a price. It, it could be all over the map, um, depending on, like I said, some contractors are pricing things in such a way that they don't actually want the business, but they'll take it if you'll pay double what they normally would, would charge. So get multiple quotes, you are looking somewhere between 12 and 20,000 if we were looking at a, a very wide range. Yeah, I would suggest, um, obviously we've had COVID related issues with supply chain, um, that's definitely impacted. We also know that, um, as you pointed out, Chris, like there's there are some HVAC contractors that are just really not even interested in getting into this kind of work. And so they'll price themselves out of the work because they're not super interested. So again, some of the work that the city is doing and Embryo Center is doing is working on um, training uh, for HVAC companies. The other thing that we've just started discussing and I think is a real good potential is a bulk buy. So if we can identify, you know, 10 homes in a neighborhood that are interested in putting a heat pump in, we have a local group that will work with us on purchasing those with an installation cost and getting the price down. Um, that's the other benefit of these types of pilot projects or neighborhood pilot projects is we can look at getting some um, reduced costs. So for instance, we've got an insulation contractor and we say, look, all these houses are basically the same. They need to get all their insulation done. Can you knock it down to a more reasonable rate? For all these folks and you don't have to market it and you don't have to have a sales guy go out and we just get the benefit of the insulation. Um, okay, so are demo homes only in the two neighborhoods we mentioned? Yes, currently they are. So phase one of this project was um, funded by the Ontario Climate, or sorry, Ottawa Climate Action Fund. Um, we received a grant uh, for that work and again it was considered a pilot project for just under a year. Um, however, we will be applying for additional funding to roll this out into other neighborhoods um, based on the success and what we've, based on what we've learned from these ones. So what worked, what didn't work, so we can apply that to other neighborhoods. And then eventually it would be fantastic if we could get this rolling out across the city in all neighborhoods um, and, and really start to move the momentum. Uh, love the idea of bulk buys. Is there something like that for solar? That's a good question, um, and I don't have the answer for you, um, Julie. There, um, go ahead, Chris. Sorry, I was gonna say solar is a little harder to bulk buy um, because inverters have to be sized properly, and um, you know each each house has to be designed for to fit the solar panels, depending on angle and and all the other stuff. Um, you we might be able to get somewhere, but I, I, yeah, it's, it's a little more complicated. So. Yeah, I would probably suggest though that you look at OREC, um, the Ottawa Renewable Energy Collective. Um, they do a ton of work with solar. They've also created a financing arm. 
Um, so there may be some options for you there. And certainly, you know, it's a fantastic group of folks that are really, really know their solar. There's lots of other solar organizations in the city of Ottawa, but ORAC is a great place to start. Um, it's a co-op essentially. So um, you get some impartial advice, I think, there. Uh, cost of an audit. So, all right. So regular audits, if you're just booking through um, Envir Centre or many other service organizations, you're looking at $500 for your initial audit and $250 for your follow-up audit, which is also required um, under all of these programs. So once you've done all your work, we've got to come back in and, and do a secondary audit. For the Future Homes Pilot Project, we have offered a big um, savings on those. So we're really looking at about 300 for your initial audit and 150 for your second audit and I should also mention that if your if your file is submitted through the greener homes program because you're going to actually do some of the stuff that audit fee is reimbursed to you over and above the five thousand dollars worth of grants so pretty low risk uh, in the grand scheme of things when it comes to paying for an audit you're most likely going to get those audit costs back okay uh, got a question about electric cars, and I don't know the answer to this one. So, Chris, maybe yes. you do. Would a plug um, for the electric car in the attached garage be possible? A detached garage, it looks like. Detached. Like the the short answer is yes. Obviously, it's a little more expensive because you need to trench out a power cable out there. Uh, so, an electrician would would have to actually dig the trench, or their laborer would dig the trench, and then the electrician would install the garage plug. It's certainly possible. I believe that actually is qualified under the Ottawa Better Homes Loan Program as well. Yeah. Uh, so short answer, yeah, very possible. Uh, mm -hmm. there's, there's many, many detached garages out there with electric plugs in them for, for cars. So Yeah, and again, you're right, Chris, there's some funding there available through, through the loan program. So Olivia has a very specific question uh, about having unfinished and uninsulated basement. So what would the process look like to obtain a grant to help fund insulating my basement when it comes time to finish it? And roughly what would the timelines typically be? Great. Yeah, I mean, this, this is a pretty common one that I'm recommending for unfinished basements, uh, especially if you're looking to finish it. You're, you're probably going to insulate it anyway. Um, so the process is you get the energy audit to start with, uh, you have to then take the energy audit results and run with it for yourself, basically. So you're finding the contractors uh, or you're hiring a general contractor to do all the work. At the end of the work, you have the second energy audit. And uh, once it's confirmed that you did put insulation in the walls, uh, you we submit that to NRCAN and NRCAN gives you your money back. So you can actually get, I'm trying to remember this off the top of my head, but I think it's $3,800 back for a basement insulation project. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, roughly roughly that uh, for a basement insulation project. Um, and it's an unfinished, uninsulated basement is one of the biggest energy leaks in a lot of houses I see. Uh, so uh, yeah. timeline, Enbridge requires things to be done in four months unless you ask nicely for an extension and you have been trying to make progress on it. Getting a renovation done in four months right now has been almost impossible for most people, unless they're doing it themselves from Home Depot. Uh, so we we see extensions given pretty much all the time. For greener homes, there is no real timeline attached to it. Um, you could wait a year and do the upgrades and then get your second audit, and that wouldn't be an issue. Uh, so the, the timeline is is flexible, we'll say that. Yeah, so my recommendation would obviously be to get the energy audit. Um, the energy advisor can also <clears throat> kind of explain to you the order in which you should go after some of these grants or incentives. Um, certainly, you know, the Enbridge one is really good for, for insulation. I must admit they're, they're offering some good rebates there. Um, and then, yeah, basically, as, as Chris said, you'd have that sort of insulated basement, as long as you're not spray foaming the basement, if you're using... Uh, product that does not require having drywall put on it right away for fire um, retardant reasons, mm -hmm. then you can leave it as long as you want and you simply have an insulated basement. Um, and then, yeah, you can, you can basically with most of the systems, you just 
drywall over it. You, you put your studs up and off to the races you are. We see it quite typically actually under our low income program. We Basements are us is what we used to call ourselves. So um, we've insulated quite a few basements with using an R20 basement blanket that kind of just rolls along the wall uh, and then we insulate over it. But there's definitely, you know, other applications that you can use. Um. Yeah, sorry, I had something else there and it's, it's gone entirely. Sorry, I got distracted by the next question. So is solar heating feasible in our climate? Um, there are solar heating walls out there, which are basically panels you put on the south facing wall of your house that collect heat and distribute it inside your house. For the most part, they're commercial focused. You, you need kind of quite a big wall to make it worth the time and effort. Um, and then passive house, like there are passive houses in Canada that have no heating system at all. Uh, they they just heat themselves with the power of the sun. So it's it's feasible, it's possible. It tends to be expensive and time consuming. Um, there are better ways to get to net zero or zero greenhouse gas emissions, how, how about that? Um, and then the follow-up question is a very good one or from a different question. Uh, we mentioned grants from Enbridge and Greener Homes. Would they work in parallel or would you get a grant from one or the other? So you can get grants from both, but you can't get grants from both for the same upgrade. So I can't replace this big window I have right here through Greener Homes and then also ask Enbridge for the same rebate money as well. But I could do my attic through Enbridge, my... Um, windows through Enbridge, and then my exterior wall insulation through Greener Homes. Uh, so I hope that answers the question. A little bit complex, and it does mean that we sometimes run into situations where I've seen people and I've recommended many times to people, if they have a gas furnace now, do everything you're gonna do with Enbridge first, get the second energy audit done so that you get your money from Enbridge, and then replace the furnace with a heat pump and get your a second second energy audit done and get your five thousand dollars back from greener homes for that. Um, so you, there's been a few houses, especially in this Future Homes Ottawa program, that I could see topping out both the Enbridge and the greener homes rebates and and getting a full ten thousand dollars back for what they're they're planning to do. Good, and then they could apply for the loan program to get them all the way there. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Good. Um, Oh, I'm not seeing any other question. Oh, there we go. Ah, love a question about embodied carbon. <laughs> so, great question on embodied carbon. Yeah. Pamela wants to know what are your thoughts on embodied carbon and retrofit options? Would some of the recommendations to get to net zero actually generate more GHG to do the retrofit? And is it better just to do the fuel switching to air source heat pump and add solar if possible? Great question. Um, that can get very complicated when you go into each individual upgrade. Uh, spray foam insulation, there's two different types. One of them puts out a lot of carbon, carbon dioxide into the air, the other doesn't put much. Um, you can say the same thing about a, a whole bunch of potential upgrades. Um, there's a wood fiber insulation that's carbon negative when you install it. So yes, sometimes, for some of the retrofits, it might make more sense just to upgrade the size of your heat pump and pay a little bit more and put more solar on it. Um, a lot of the time, the downsizing the size of the heat pump and reducing the energy expense would be worthwhile, at least from a dollars and cents point of view. Admittedly, our electricity grid is quite clean, um, so that, that nudges the math in the other direction again. I could go on about this for hours. Uh, it's, a, it's a complex topic. So if it's important to you to limit GHGs over the next 20 years, um, you'd have to look at each upgrade and, and see what's, what's happening with it. Yeah, the future, or sorry, the Better Homes Ottawa website will at, eventually, uh, we're, we're sort of launching it in its base format right now with the access to the energy audits and uh, and rebates and incentives and planning your retrofit, but we are planning on 
providing information um, about uh, embodied carbon. We actually have a couple of training sessions coming up that have to do with embodied carbon. So we're also very interested in that. The other thing that we've started to think about uh, is construction waste and how we're gonna deal with all of the waste that comes from doing these massive retrofits. So um, we've engaged a couple of students to do some research on some unbuilding projects and things like that so that we can actually manage the waste that we're going to create by you know removing all of these things and, and retrofitting homes. And Linda, there are no dumb questions, uh, but yes, the Enbridge grants are for Enbridge gas customers. So you have to have a gas account uh, in their name and then you would be eligible. And if you're not an Enbridge gas customer, it means that you're heating by electricity, so you're already doing the world a favor. <laughs> and Yes, so you have to be heating with natural gas for the Enbridge grants, but if you were a Union Gas customer, Enbridge now owns Union Gas. So um, basically everybody in Ontario that uses gas is the Enbridge customer. But mm -hmm. you could be an Enbridge customer and not heating your home with natural gas. It does happen. I've seen a few houses that do that. Um, yeah, the next question was, which spray foam is carbon intensive and which isn't? <laughs> It's, it's actually about the type of propellant they use to spray the spray foam. Some of them have a global warming potential above methane and others use just straight CO2. So it's kind of, each manufacturer has a different, different thing going on there. Um, the lowest types of insulation are not spray foams at all. They're cellulose or sheep's wool or even straw, not many people are insulating with straw anymore. Um, but yeah, it's the carbon intensity of the spray foaming process is, is again, kind of complicated. You'd have to look at the manufacturer data from it. Um, I would suggest as well, we're dealing with the waste of the spray foam canisters is another big issue. Uh, we uh, run some programs where we do use some forms of spray for air sealing and then we have to deal with the canisters afterwards and that's a big issue. Um, as Chris said, there are lots of environmentally friendly options for insulation. Um, you know, our good friends, uh, good friend Mike Holmes on Homes is always telling everybody to spray foam and absolutely you're going to get this beautiful air barrier for sure, but there are other technologies available that are actually not harmful to the environment that can get you to the same place. Um, and we're seeing insulation companies moving that way in a lot of cases. Um, Eva, how far are these new green technologies? So I think maybe your question is, how far away are they? Uh, oh, how long? How, how do they last? Okay. Um, I would suggest as long as any of the older technologies do. Um, Chris, I'm sure you could talk to the HVAC side of things, but certainly from an insulation standpoint, um, you're looking at an average life of about 25 years is what most folks are, are suggesting. And certainly, you know, any wood fiber, cellulose, any of those other um, non-toxic um, applications would have the same. Um, as far as a heat pump goes, um, would you suggest the same thing, Chris, that you're looking at the same lifespan as a, as a traditional gas furnace or? Yeah, you're looking at the same lifespan as a gas furnace, which is typically 10 to 15 years. Um, I have seen 25 year old furnaces out there, but they're far, few and far between. Uh, 20 years is sort of your max for a furnace and it'll be about your max for a air source heat pump. Geothermal systems, ground source heat pumps, 40 years is, is reasonable out of those. Um, right. A lot more expensive to install, but bulletproof. I love them. Right. Hopefully we find a way to install them without drilling massive wells that cost lots of money. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> yes. Yeah, um, Miklos had a question as well, um, which I think, you know, we both would know the answer to, but uh, hypothetically my furnace dies in January. What do you suggest besides just running out and getting the first gas furnace available? Good question. Um, replace your furnace before it dies in January with a heat pump, because heat pumps are taking eight to 12 weeks, minimally right now to come in, unless they're off the shelf units, which does happen as well. Um, if it does happen unexpectedly, your furnace was eight years old and it just collapses, that 
that happens. I, I don't know. That's a that's a hard situation. Um, I personally would be desperate to install a heat pump. I don't know how long I would be willing to survive off of my gas fireplace and electric heat. Um, I have a gas fireplace that can heat my house fairly well. If you don't have that, electric heat for a month in January would be a relatively expensive investment. So, um, yeah. I think that's one of the reasons why as part of this particular program, we're looking at these stuff recommendation reports so that we can tell you, you know, your furnace has another probably 10 years left in it. You know, maybe it's not the best idea to swap that out right this very second, but you can start to plan for that retrofit, um, you know, further on down the line. Because as you pointed out, Chris, like nobody's furnace dies in July, right? Everybody's furnace dies in the middle of winter. And then of course you're gonna just replace it with with like or maybe a more efficient version um because you don't have to do anything else but that's one of the reasons why we are are providing those reports so that you have a better idea of when those things might be coming up for replacement and making the appropriate plans to move to a more energy efficient system a um, couple of questions here on hempcrete insulation and i see pamela has responded and lets us know that a group out of montreal sells a hemp fiber bat insulation I don't know a ton about it. Um, I do know, like I said, I'm working with a with a group that focuses specifically on low embodied carbon building materials. Um, they've got a great wood fiber product. Um, but yeah, I, I'm sure um, have a look at what Pamela has suggested. And otherwise, I would shoot EnviroCenter uh, a quick email and we'll get somebody on our staff to dig into that a little bit further for you. And, and yeah, Heather, I, I did a project on hempcrete that was probably almost 10 years ago now um, in my university courses, but hempcrete is awesome and I'm hoping we see more and more of it, especially with you know, the whole legalization thing. I was in a marijuana production facility in New Brunswick, massive building. I'm not sure what they're doing with all that wasted plant material uh, and I'm hoping that there, there seems to be an opportunity there. So I'm hoping we see more hempcrete soon. It is, uh, it's concrete except made out of hemp. So, yeah, I mean, yeah. we all know hemp has got some awesome, you know, you can you can do pretty much anything with it. So you're absolutely right, Chris, with the with the new legalization, maybe we'll start to see that as a byproduct of, uh, of the uh, fun part of cannabis, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, so Vadim wants to know what your view on operating cost of air source heat pump versus gas furnace. So, you know, I have my standard spiel. I always talk about Greg, um, but we'll ask you your view, Chris. I think it's probably going to be in parallel. Um, it's roughly a wash today, um, depending on what the price of natural gas and electricity does in the future. Hard to, my crystal ball is pretty foggy. That being said, um, the air source heat pump is going to save you 80 to 90 percent of your greenhouse gas emissions and will cost about the same to run as a gas a high efficiency gas furnace so yeah. yeah and i know in our particular case we had a former colleague replace his now i don't know at the time if it was because there wasn't a huge demand for heat pumps and heat pump pump installs but i know as he was swapping out his natural gas furnace and his central air he moved to a cold climate air source heat pump it was about the same fee. And then his operating costs, as I said, were, as Chris was mentioning, were about the same. You do avoid all of the sort of transportation prices and things that are built into your gas bill that, you know, maybe you're not paying attention to. It's not just the gas that you're using. Um, and then we also have to keep in mind that if the carbon tax continues, the, the price of natural gas will be triple what it is now in a year or two years. Like it, it, it goes pretty quickly, the, the increase in natural gas. So at that point, moving to, as Chris pointed out, basically a clean source of energy here in Ontario with hydro um, is, is the logical choice. Okay, Linda, what do we think about wool insulation? From a sustainability standpoint, I quite like it. From a R value per inch, so that's the amount of insulation you get per inch of material in your wall, it's not the highest. So there is a balance to be struck there. Um, new home construction or deep, deep retrofits, like you're tearing out drywall uh, on your exterior walls, it's easier to go with something like wool, which allows you to put in eight inches instead of the typical five and a half or something like that to, to hit the same R value. Um, 
yeah, obviously it's it's low carbon embodied or negative carbon embodied, and it works well. It's just you need a little more of it to get the same effect. Awesome. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, we are coming to the end of our questions, and we are coming to the end of our hour. Um, so let's give it a second and see if anybody else has any questions. And also click Pamela's link that she put in the chat there for the uh, carbon smart insulation. It's a very cool link that I hadn't seen before, but it shows it very nicely where your carbon dioxide uh, footprint of your insulation materials is. So very cool. Um, yeah, thank Martin you very Martin. much. We appreciate anybody jumping in. Chris is my go to expert, but now I'm going to start to be looking at folks that we're presenting to because clearly we've got a really engaged group here. Um, I really want to thank everybody for coming out this evening to participate in this workshop, webinar, whatever we're calling it. Um, I'd also like to thank, you know, so thank all of our attendees who took the time to join us today. Mm -hmm. If you liked this session, don't forget to check out our upcoming events and activities um, that we have uh, to learn more about home retrofit home retrofits, future homes, Ottawa project. To stay up to date, you're going to want to sign up for our future homes newsletter. And Darren is going to post a link to that in the chat. So feel free to sign up and then you'll get updates on how we're doing with the pilot project, um, events, um, workshops, all kinds of um, bits of information that you can get access to. Um, and that's really it. We really do appreciate you folks coming out. Thanks again, Chris, for everything, always being there. Um, really, really appreciate your technical expertise. Um, and we really appreciate everybody coming out. So I hope everyone has a fantastic evening.